Hello and welcome to this iMeki webinar. My name is Howard Warriner and I'm on iMeki's Warwickshire Area Committee within the Midland region. Today, greatly assisted by Fiona Wong from iMeki's head office in London, but working from home, we're pleased to bring you a second presentation, this time on the testing and optimization of the Dennis Eagle eCollect, an electric refuse collection vehicle, or RCV, by Andy Graves. He's product marketing manager chassis and joined the waste vehicle manufacturing industry in 1972 with Shelburg and Drury, moving to Dennis Eagle in 1991. He's been involved with the product development process from design, development and production through to sales and marketing for refuse collection vehicles and specialist HGV chassis. Like me, he's both a keen cyclist and a green advocate. So over to you, Andy. Thank you, Howard. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I'll now start our pre presentation on the eCollect. And as Howard said, this is focused on the testing and optimization of the product. Just to give a little bit of background about our company, uh, the Dennis Brothers started back in 1895 in Guildford and they started producing bicycles, lawn mowers, cars, and progressed on to trucks, fire engines, and of course buses that they're famous for. But with keen business minds, in the uh, early 1900s, they started to target niche markets, and of course one of those was municipal vehicles. Eagle Engineering uh, were a bodybuilder who started in around 1907 in Warwick, and traditionally they used Dennis chassis very much to uh, go under their bodies. And the companies were brought together in the 1970s by the Hest Air Group. The current factory we're in was built and was the first on the industrial estate around 1985. And uh, really that was a bringing together of the municipal chassis and the, the bodies. And there are a few milestones there, but the Elite Low Entry cab was launched in 1992 and our Olympus Smooth Sided Refuse Body in 2009. We've had various owners over the years, including banks like ABN AMRO and NatWest Equity Partners. But we were purchased by Ross Rocker, a Spanish company, in 2006. And then in 2016, Turberg took over the controlling interest of the, the group. Just a, a few facts there about the, the company. We uh, employ around 860 people at uh, Warwick. Uh, not all of them, of course, are on site. We have around 50 external service engineers. We've got over 15 depots now around the country. And you can see that our turnover has increased over the years and we will probably sell around 250 million pounds worth of vehicles in the, the current year. We produce complete refuse vehicles, but we also work with Turberg Matak who provide recycler bodies, which of course can also be mounted to our chassis and other makes of chassis. With regards to the chassis range, the Elite is our core product, but we work through from two to four axle vehicles. And we also provide a left-hand drive vehicle, which is badged as the Renault Access for continental use, effectively. But of course, they don't take all of the range that we use. It's very rare in Europe, for example, to use a six by four chassis. So the six by two rear steer is the, the big seller for, for Renault. And of course, our bodies, uh, we not only make a single compartment refuse body, we make a split recycler body, the twin pack. And we also work with Turberg to provide the duo and the one pass where a recycler pod sits between the cab and the, the refuse body. So now onto the, the main content 
of this webinar. We're going to set the scene with a brief section on vehicle legislation, discuss some of the special tests conducted during the project to provide a full electric refuse vehicle, then the e-collect solution itself and why it's important to understand the level of testing and development the product has undergone. And then, of course, we hope to have time for a brief Q&A session. When we set our design brief, we decided to carry over as many components as possible from the Diesel Power Delete 6. This allowed us to focus our testing and development program on the controls and drive line. In addition, the electric HGV is a new breed of truck with several tests which were still under development when we started the project. One of the major tasks was to gain the relevant approvals to supply as a complete vehicle, which we will cover in this webinar. Here we give a definition of homologation or type approval. In practical terms, for components and systems that have been used previously, we can often use an existing approval and just extend it. But of course, for any new items, then we have to gain new approvals. And the next slide is a little busy, but it just shows the, uh, the number of key items that have been tested and approved. For example, even though the traditional fuel tanks have been deleted, the mounts for the battery packs still require the same type of test and approval for a fuel source and potential risk if the mounts fail. And where we've had to modify the chassis and cab design to accommodate new equipment, this has also required testing to extend existing approvals or gain new approvals. And of course, that does mean we've had to work with our suppliers and partners in some cases. In the early stages of development, we'd obviously try and look for components or systems that were already or tested or approved as the quickest uh, route to market. But we had to develop some new solutions and also work with those suppliers to replace items. And then as time has progressed and the de developments have uh, increased, we've had to go back in some cases to retest and and test further. But there are some standard vehicle safety related items like the brakes and the steering and occupant protection, which we must address fully for each new variant. So for example, these are pictures from an earlier crash test with Myra Hariba, where destructive testing takes place. Uh, but we're now at uh, level three of uh, Reg 29 testing. So of course we've had to carry out further testing on the cabs. And here are images from a previous stability test where with Norbrems we've used a weighted vehicle to check the limits of stability and to calibrate the electronic, electronic leveling control, the stability control, the ABS and electronic braking systems to ensure functionality and compliance to the regulations. And of course, the high voltage systems run at 600 volts. So that has required re-education for our engineers and technicians. Functional safety techs have had to be carried out for both the low and the high voltage systems, the brakes, the steering and the driver controls to ensure there are redundancies and cross checks in place. So if there's a, a single point failure, the vehicle does not produce an unintended response. For example, a failure in the throttle pedal causing a, an undemanded acceleration. With the potential for full torque from startup, we've also worked with our partners to ensure realistic torque limits were made to prevent component damage like to the differential or the prop shaft, but also to provide progressive driving style and performance. We don't want it 
to perform like a race car it has to work as a traditional vehicle but of course we want to gain the benefits of the electric motor and its performance and not only does the vehicle have to operate in a range of temperatures but the batteries have to be able to cope with those conditions so we also have a cooling system for the motors and controls which must be tested and compliant and that's currently to a standard suitable for general use across Europe and the UK from minus 10 to plus 41 degrees centigrade. We use five battery packs, each with 60 kilowatt hour capacity, so 300 kilowatt hour in total. But you'll see that they're nearly uh, 400 kilograms per pack. So given their weight, they're carefully positioned around the vehicle where they provide the best load distribution over the course of the collection round. But we had to ensure the mounts and fixings to the chassis frame are strong enough using finite element analysis and real world testing. Without these processes, you can't be sure the components are fit for purpose. And of course, we've also had to conduct durability testing um, to ensure the motor, the gearbox, the driveline mounts and supports are up to the job. Um, and of course, most of the durability testing is at proving grounds, but we also do have real world testing out in the field. And of course, the purpose of the accelerated durability testing is to simulate the damage that the vehicle would be subjected to over a full lifetime of operating but condensed into only a few months and this durability cycle is developed using real world data analysis to create a representative simulation of the vehicle use and of course by performing those tests we can identify any shortfalls in design that, that maybe don't show up in the FEA analysis allowing us to ensure we have a a durable product by the time we reach production. The program of validation tests also ensure the vehicle always remains safe and reliable, regardless of electrical or software faults, which could be introduced by misuse or error. The eCollect has proven to be faster when accelerating compared to the traditional diesel vehicle. But that does mean we've had to ensure the stability control, the suspension and the braking are all fine tuned to suit. And we've also conducted gradeability tests from standstill with a fully laden truck and achieved good results. But also where we've been out on the road, in particular in the South Wales area, we've achieved uh, good performance on the 22% gradient, for example, without any problems. The field trials primarily allow us to test the refuse collection in real world conditions, as it's almost impossible to simulate this. By monitoring the trials closely, we can optimize the operation of the hydraulics and control systems to ensure efficient operation of the body, the compactor and the bin lift systems. And as a result of the field trials, we've ensured the vehicle is configured to optimize the driving feel as well the packing capabilities and the waste discharge and travel to and from the discharge site can be handled without compromise on the operating range we've also carried out safe charging tests with a range of smart chargers here you can see some of the brands that we've tested on to ensure the vehicle can only be recharged safely but one thing we have found is that the actual power supply can cause problems, particularly with older sites, uh, with new sites built, say, from uh, 2005, 2010 onwards, where there's a 63 amp supply. We've not really had too many problems. But with a 32 amp supply, we've often found that the systems trip out after a short period. So we have to use the smart charger to reduce the loading so that the vehicle can charge properly. 
The e-collect requires a nominal 50 kilowatt hour and ideally 63 amp, but it will work with 32 amp system, three phase AC. And it's a 415 volt smart charger, as I said, using the CCS2 standard. And that uses a feedback protocol to check the state of charge during the charging process. Some extra training is required for the vehicle. And of course, PPE is required, particularly when you're connecting the, the charger. But for day-to-day -day operation, it is effectively just the same as using a, a diesel vehicle. We do offer a electric vehicle safety equipment kit and there are details on our website where you can see the link there. But as well as safety, we've also carried out efficiency tests and the fine tuning of the vehicle is vital to make sure we understand the various waste, waste streams and the collection methods being crucial to long-term reliable operation. So we've done lots of data logging, testing, and analysis over the years to try and make sure that we can cover most operators' requirements. Some of the work we've done with local universities dates back to 2006. This was with a hybrid project, hybrid project with uh, Warwick University. And you'll see that uh, we've carried on and here we're looking at the weight of the vehicle, the speed the vehicle needs to travel at, the body pressure, the bin pressure, so the power consumption that's needed. So we're not just moving the vehicle, we've also got to operate a lot of machinery as well throughout the day. And we need to make sure that we've tailored the vehicle to suit. We have been asked about overall power consumption. And of course, the duty cycle per round can vary greatly. But here we show some sample data for a typical day's collection. This was around the Leamington and Warwick area. But uh, we've also looked at other areas and the key purpose is to ensure the vehicle can cope with those other operations. And of course we continue to data log and to try and optimize the vehicle for maximum efficiency and of course maximum range. Here, this is a bit of a busy side, but slide, but the, the area in red is where a double shift occurred and we actually got down to 11% state of charge, which we wouldn't recommend doing all the time. But the vehicle traveled over 96 miles and uh, managed to complete all of the work that was necessary, just as a, a diesel vehicle would have done. So, that concludes the, the webinar. So over to Howard to see uh, if we have some questions. Okay, Andy, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, we've got some questions coming in. Um, yeah. The first one that came in, I'm not entirely sure uh, <laughs> what what's behind it or you know, what, what the answer would be, but whether you perhaps understand it better than me, it's um, how do you test the functionality safety requirements? Um, well, in some cases, yeah, in some cases, it's a matter of disconnecting items and see okay. that you can't do things that you shouldn't. But in other cases, it's introducing faults to try and make sure that the vehicle remains safe. So, for example, putting a full signal on the throttle while the handbrake's on, it, it still shouldn't try and move the vehicle. Yeah. Uh, that's a simple example, but uh, mm, that's yeah. just one of the, the tests. Yeah. So it's all got okay. to be quite interlinked, doesn't it? All, all the yeah. Have to talk to each other. Right. Uh, I'm just yeah. trying to look at the questions now. Okay. Um, yeah. There's a question on PPE requirements. So yeah. Person saying that it's not required for road cars. So why would it be necessary with this vehicle? Uh, well, our health and safety people feel that we should. Generally, you'll find that the drivers and crews wear gloves anyway because they're dealing with waste. There's obvious risks there. But uh, we recommend that you do use rubber gloves when you're connecting up. 
in fact with the ccs2 combi connector until it's fully connected and latches in there isn't a high voltage transmitted through the connector anyway so yes uh, the, the the questioner is is correct you shouldn't necessarily need to but we do recommend that you do do it hmm. you do use ppe thanks yep. Um, in now, so yeah, <laughs> there is a question order. about how quiet the vehicle is. The, yeah. the drive-by noise level is 60 dBA. For a diesel, our diesel vehicle, it would be around 80 dBA. Um, and just as an example, 60 dBA is a normal conversation. 90 dBA is a lawnmower. And our diesel refuse vehicles operate at about 100 dBA when they're actually collecting compacting waste so it is yeah. markedly quieter and certainly that's something the drivers and crews have, have found it's much nicer to work around the vehicle yeah i think the questions as well asking about whether you'll be looking to make other parts of the operation quieter the crusher and lifters and that sort of thing so i guess they're, uh, they're being carried over from the diesel vehicle at the moment yeah, they're carried over from the diesel vehicle and they're not actually that noisy. It's the actual waste dropping into the hopper that um, tends to make most of the noise, particularly with glass. Um, our parent company, Ross Rocker in Spain, some years ago, uh, did some experiments with rubber linings in the tailgate and so on. And they do work for a while, but of course the material degrades, gets worn down. So the benefits were very short-lived really okay now there's one about charging powering the body systems from indirect hydraulic operation yeah. well we we do use hydraulics we have a motor driving a double hydraulic pump mm -hmm. um so we are already using electro hydraulic systems our bin lift systems are already available as an electric only option and we are going to be looking at whether or not that's a, a viable option but for the packing mechanism you know there are linear drives and other methods that we might be able to use but that really would be another stage on from what we've done so far right i think you mentioned the braking is that electronic did you say uh, there's an electric motor driving the compressor and then the control systems themselves are all electronic anyway. Yes, so uh, it is a full electronic braking system. Hmm. Okay. okay. Thanks. So timeline and cost <laughs> for the test and development program. Is that it well, maybe not something you can go into in great detail? But... No, the, the timeline, we actually started the problem uh, the project, sorry, why did I say problem? The project around five years ago, um, and we were actually starting to deliver customer vehicles. Um, we delivered the first into Nottingham, for example, two into Nottingham in October, and there are various other councils, local authorities we've supplied into. Um, Islington are the first in the London area. So they are starting to get out into the UK at the moment. Probably it's around um, 2021, 20, 2022 for Europe. Um, and there are some areas like the Middle East where the operating temperatures, uh, temperatures might prevent us supplying at the moment. Mm, right. Yeah, I was wondering um, about you mentioned about the battery temperature, well, the, the temperatures that the vehicle had been uh, tested in, uh, that the batteries would. Would they generally be warmer than the rest of the vehicle? Um, we've not really had any problems. And of course, we've been up to about 35 degrees ambient temperature in the UK this year. We don't have a cooling system on the batteries, but we've not had any problems with them. No. Uh, there are quite a few questions coming in now, aren't there? So um, <laughs> could I? Uh, um, the life cycle of the battery, was there... Is there a standard um, to do that? Or? Well, we expect them to last around eight to ten years as front line for front line operation, but there is a second life to them. 
it might be that some individual cells break down, but um, we already know of uh, this type of battery. It's similar to that used in the Nissan Leaf, where they're being used as uh, power banks for schools and hospitals and other operations like that, or actually as power banks to charge the vehicles. Um, yeah, I wondered as well then, if, that, if the question was asking about the sort of charging cycle and, and the light. Ah. Yeah, I'm not sure, but... Well, there are there are standard um, tests for that. Uh, Regulation right. 100 is about the safety of the battery, but there's also um, charge tests and so on that take place. Of course, we've worked with uh, Magtech in the Sheffield and Rod Rotherham area as our partner to supply the batteries and the motors. So a lot of the testing has been part of their product cycle, but they've already done work on buses for several years and various other vehicles as well. Hmm. Uh, there's one about current depots having the electrical infrastructure. Yeah, you said the um, modern ones are better with the high, higher current rating. Yeah, we do know of some local authorities that have had problems, but a lot with the newer systems are okay. Hmm. The cost um, really, that would have to be people like National Grid or SSE, uh, mm. Scottish Power and so on to answer questions like that. But there can be considerable costs. And at the moment, we're only really offering a handful of vehicles per customer because we do recognize that there could be a problem with trying to charge a whole fleet of vehicles. I see, yeah. Um, miles of testing. Um, well, just on one vehicle, we've operated with over 30 end users since last November. That's November 2019. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure of the actual miles we've done with the vehicle, but on average, it tends to do about 60 to 80 miles a day. Um, and of course, we've also done lots of durability testing. We've done testing with uh, weight onto chassis and so on at Myra and Millbrook. So there is a lot of miles under our belt already. Yeah. Someone's asked about the range of the vehicle. Um, oh, it's affected by temperature, yeah. Yeah, below about five degrees centigrade, it certainly does have an effect. But again, so far, and we've, we've worked with uh, both development vehicles and the trial vehicle uh, for a couple of years now, we've not really had any problems. Mm -hmm. um, we do sell diesel vehicles that can operate to minus 15 or minus 25 degrees C. At the moment, the e-collect is only intended to operate around minus 10 degrees C. But there are certain things that can be done when you're charging the vehicle. It might be that we could introduce preheating on the cab and so on. And we might need to consider other additional systems if we do want to try and offer to other markets but that's probably two or three years away yet okay thanks um puts, the the <laughs> yeah well um as i said ross rocker have tried putting um soundproofing outside the the steel structure okay. and it does help but um it's quite costly and of course it adds weight to the vehicle and for most operators, the the payload they can collect is sometimes more important than the the uh, the noise levels. But of course, if we are starting to operate at night, as they do in many European cities, then maybe that has to be considered. Uh -huh. um, how difficult was it to achieve good brake blending with an air brake system? Well, effectively, the air brake system is controlled by electronics. So we work with Norbremps, who uh, have lots of experience of this type of thing. So I would say it wasn't too difficult, but of course it did include quite a bit of testing to make sure everything did work properly. Mm -hmm. um, packaging benefits. There certainly were some benefits. By taking away with the engine, we were able to put one of the uh, battery packs under the cab and that also helps with the weight distribution taking some of that weight forward but we've kept the same body size as we would normally we've been supplying glider chassis to pvi in france since 2009 2010 
with their vehicles, they converted our chassis, but they added three and a half ton of batteries behind the cab. But it meant that the body space was reduced. The body volume reduced from about 21 cubic meters to 17 cubic meters. So our design, admittedly, we've gone for a narrow track vehicle, but we're using a standard 19 cubic meter body. Okay. Where are batteries sourced? As I said, they are Nissan Leaf type batteries, but uh, our current supplier is uh, Magtech. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, that, that will carry on through, but I know that there are new generations of batteries coming through, which we may have to consider in the future. There's a question it's on a electrical and hydraulic, or hydraulic in the wheel motors. Uh, well, uh, with our concept um, hybrid vehicle that we did with Myra, that had a wheel, mo or there were motors behind the wheels, there were drive shafts through them, but it was relatively expensive, and we felt that it was better for the production vehicles at the moment to stick with the tried and tested formula of uh, a motor with a reduction gearbox and a prop shaft to the standard axle and differential. But we do see there could be benefits from that, but we need component costs to come down and to be assured about the reliability of the the motors and the the axles. Mm -hmm. And okay. could you say something about the typical range and time to charge, please? Um, yeah, generally we try to um, suggest that they don't get below about twenty to twenty five percent state of charge. And with a 63 amp system, that normally takes about seven to eight hours to charge. With a 32 amp system, that's more likely to be nine to 10 hours. But of course, most refuse vehicles finish fairly early in the afternoon. So have lots of time where they can be charging. Yeah. The that's system nice. voltage is yeah. 600 volts. Hmm. Um, and uh, I would say really that was uh, a decision that was um, made for us because of the systems that were already av available. Right. Uh -huh. the, the total weight unloaded is around 15 tons, but fully loaded. The vehicle, at the moment, there's still a question mark about what you can actually operate to, but technically it can go to 27 tons. Uh, the tax rating through DVLA is limited to 26 tons for a three-axle vehicle. Um, but there is a derogation that does allow the installation weight to be added to that 26 tons. What we try to do is make sure that there's a safety factor. So we have an axle weighing system that can cut out the packer so we purposely set that down below the maximum level to try and avoid any problems with axle overloading. Generally, you'll get 10, 10 and a half ton payload on the vehicle anyway. And that's normally for two rounds a day. And the cost comparison, you mentioned this in the previous webinar. Yeah, uh, I would say roughly it, it's, um, it's twice as much as a diesel vehicle, but of course you're not putting diesel into it. You don't have diesel particulate filters to clean every now and then or replace. You don't have to do engine oil changes. So there are there are certainly benefits in uh, the electric vehicle, and we we see that after seven or eight years, it should be cost neutral. Mm -hmm. And then were, were some different operators involved directly in the development process? Um, yes, we we have. We've had various workshops. We've also involved, um, in particular in the Warwick and Leamington area, Suez have worked with us quite closely where we wanted to put a vehicle out for field trials. Um, and we have done work uh, in some of the... the um, Double shifting trial was down in uh, London with uh, Veolia. So we have worked with the operators, but um, 
I don't understand the, the question about operator seats at the rear. Does that mean footboards? Because um, that's something that's not allowed in the UK anyway. But we certainly do offer it for Europe. Right, okay. Um, maybe maybe uh, Adrian would like to um, post uh, something through to me, if you can transmit the question through. Mm -hmm. uh, and Adrian has asked another one. Um, we're not really planning to, to do anything with autonomous vehicles at the moment, but we have supplied chassis for autonomous operation for other right. countries. Right. Um, it, it's not really something that we feel t to be uh, top of our agenda at the moment. Hmm. Um, and will they be assembled? And, yeah, they they are as assembled alongside our current diesel vehicles, but at the footprint where the engine and gearbox go into the vehicle, it obviously bypasses that footprint to then go on and have the cab fitted, and it also bypasses the engine management software installation um, mm -hmm. we then laser align the axles and we send it through to our second build unit unit two of course where the electric motor the batteries and so on are fitted but the brackets are already mounted on on the chassis assembly line okay all right, thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah there's a question uh, as well uh, uh, going on about the potential for soundproofing, whether there could be um, some sort of temporary uh, colour schemes or advertising on the outside of the vehicle. Uh, well, a, a lot of people do use, um, there are various systems available for signboards um, with a smooth side anyway. It's possible now to have a vinyl wrap that can be fitted to the side of the vehicle anyway um, but we have worked with composite materials and so on for signboard so that that certainly is feasible but of course additional cost and weight are often a factor that the the end users really don't want to uh, have included in the product mm. do, you, do you do the, the vinyl wraps yourself or would that be them. No, there are specialist companies. Uh, right. Often will provide the dimensions for the vehicle, and they'll have the artwork, or they'll devise the artwork with the customer, and then they'll come and install it in in the factory, or on their own site, of course. So you said that they'd be roughly twice the cost. Uh, yes. So I think the question wanting to know what that is in pounds. Well, <laughs> It depends on the spec of the vehicle, but a standard diesel vehicle could cost 180 to 200,000 pounds for a single compartment vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I'll let them do the maths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I've certainly got through a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, somebody interested to visit your facility, I, I guess once the current restrictions uh, we've got through those. Uh, would you be able to host a visit for that? Yes, certainly. And we do have IMECE members. I think one of our guys, Steve Gosling, has just received his chartered status. So uh, we certainly have several IMECE members on site. But if you'd like to forward Adrian's details, we can sort something out. Yeah, certainly. I'd be very interested to uh, to arrange one of those yeah. visits. So yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks. Um, the cost of manufacture, the cost of manufacture itself is very similar, but of course the cost of some of the components are markedly different. And really, it's the batteries at the moment that are the biggest cost for the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks. There may be one or two extra last-minute questions, but um, uh, I thank. The audience for participating very well and thank you Andy for your presentation and for answering all the questions 
thanks to Fiona as well. You. Yes, uh, thank you to Fiona as well for uh, organising the uh, administration and the IT side of things. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Andy, or to close? And, no, I think that's about it. Uh, but uh, as you said, we can certainly, once the COVID kerfuffle is over, we can sort out uh, some visits to the plant at Warwick. Mm, great, thanks. So thanks everybody for joining this iMaking webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.